Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be talking about a die-off. A die-off is when a good number of animals in a particular area, well, begin to die. This is a story that is close to me both personally and physically. This past weekend a major die-off began in Oakland's Lake Merritt, where thousands and thousands of marine animals have washed up on the shore, are lying on the lake bed or floating just on top of the water. It's everywhere. The fish include smelt, striped bass, bat rays, gobies, halibut, mussels, marine worms, and crabs. Lake Merritt is this fascinating lake right in the middle of the city of Oakland. The lake is connected to the San Francisco Bay, through which then it's also connected to the Pacific Ocean. The lake is governed by tides, which means fresh water comes in and out all of the time along with the tides, and this brings a fascinating mix of both marine life and marine plants. And with the marine life comes a number of marine birds, including brown and white pelicans, cormorants, egrets, grebes, coots, and herons. Now, during the pandemic, I began going to the lake every day as well. We work at home, which I'm still doing. And during this time, I was able to really learn and observe this incredible web of an ecosystem, again, in this lake right in the middle of the city. I think of shows we've done in the past in which we've talked about the importance of making both our urban and suburban areas and neighborhoods into places that are habitable to wildlife. Well, this to me was a great example of how we can do it. Again, this lake right in the middle of the city. And people in Oakland like to claim that this lake was the first wildlife refuge in North America. If that's true or not, I don't know, but that's what we like to say dating back to 1870. And it's a place I go to every day just to get a sense of wonder and nature. But then when I went on Sunday morning, all I saw was death everywhere. It was like an apocalyptic scene in a horror film. Now, the die-in is believed to be caused by a special kind of algae bloom in the San Francisco Bay, though that hasn't been quite confirmed yet. And it's probably caused an algae bloom by a mixture of chemicals in the water and when it mixes with warmer water. And now we are even beginning to see reports of other die-offs happening throughout the Bay region. Well, today we're going to be talking about this. And my guest for this is Damon Tai. Damon Tai works in biotech and in his spare time is a naturalist with a 20-year history observing the organisms of Lake Merritt. Damon Tai, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this radio program. Good morning, Mitch. Now, this is going to be just like old times. Uh, Damon Ty and I used to live in the same neighborhood for a number of years. And whenever I would run into him, I would just start on the street. I would just pepper him with a ton of questions. So, this, Damon, this is going to be just just like that. <laughs> just uh, like that. <laughs> I, I Really. Uh, I, 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 I believe you were the one who broke this story on Sunday morning. Some people mistakenly, but good heartedly gave me that credit. But all I was doing was amplifying uh, what you had already put out as somebody who has observed the lake even longer than I have for over 20 years. Talk to me about your experience going to the lake on Sunday morning and what you saw. Oh, it, um, I mean, it was it was heartbreaking. I actually went to Lake Merritt's not expecting to see this, not like anybody did on Sunday. I went there to actually collect a, a mushroom that is rare to Lake Mare that somebody told me was there. So I'd come out to the lake very early, figured after I'd taken a sample of this mushroom, I was going to go down and just check the water, see if there are any nudibranchs, kind of my normal behavior. Yeah, I often I see the- you with boots <laughs> on out in the bed of the, the lake. Yep. And as soon as I hit the edge, I knew something was different. There was just littered with uh, yellowfin goby bodies just left and right. Um, I'm on the eastern side of the lake when this is happening. I'm kind of like looking around like, okay, what's causing this? Is there a spill right here out of maybe the drain that I'm next to? I don't see any indication of that. And then as I look out towards the outlet of Lake Merritt by the Green Bridge, I realize that the numbers just increase and and my heart just kind of collapsed because I think at that moment, like I was unconsciously putting together what had been going on for about a month, which was we'd been seeing this algal bloom since the start of August. Um, actually, I was I think I was flying out of Oakland on August 2nd and I saw this just jet black algal bloom developing in front of Alameda. When I came back two days later, there was just this kind of golden color to the water all over the East Bay. And uh, professionals had identified this within that week saying, hey, this is heterosigma. 
this is one that we know occasionally leads to fish die-offs. And so in the back of my mind, I knew that was a possibility, but we were two, three weeks out and we hadn't seen anything. And so it had kind of escaped that that possibility existed. And then it just came slamming all in with one kind of visual feed of just seeing all these fish. Um, and then I just started wanting to walk the entire lake, see how big is this event? Is it just isolated just to the front of the lake? Uh, I ended up doing a full walk and any place I stopped along the shore, there were dead fish right underneath the green bridge. I mean, there was, it felt like there were more fish than grains of sand. Um, and just of every type, not just these little gobies, but there were striped bass, there were flat fish, like flounders, halibut type of stuff. Um, things I usually don't even get to see in the lake. Uh, I was seen for the first time, but I was seeing them dead. Yeah, you, you say it was like more dead fish than grains of sand in, in, on, on the bottom of the bed or on on the shore of, of, of the lake. And that that's really not an understatement. You posted photos of so many dead fish that they were literally on top of each other. Yeah, I mean, it's just I've, I've never seen an event like this. I've only seen pictures of things like this right from the Gulf of Mexico and, and things like this. And it's one of those things you just never think is going to happen here especially because Lake Merritt, as you know, we, you've kind of alluded to, since I've known you, since we've lived around there, it's only been getting better due to Measure DD project work over the last 20 years. Like we've seen that water quality go up. I've, I've personally seen that diversity go up. Um, I've just been amazed at what we can do as humans to repair a habitat. And then just to have it all come crashing down within a few days is just it's just heartbreaking. Just want to underscore the importance of what you're talking about there. In the early 2000s, we voted on a measure called Double D, and that invested a lot of money into the lake and improved the parks around it. And able and for you know, the lake is a sort of cultural place too for Oakland, where people go have uh, parties and picnics and barbecues. For those who don't know about Lake Merritt, the whole quote unquote barbecue Becky thing happened at Lake Merritt. That's sort of one of the more famous things that have happened. Um, but also the money put into the lake opened it up again once to the bay, which it's a saltwater lake. So, I mean, this is one of the tragedies, the number of very large bat rays, dead bat rays that we're also seeing in the lake. It's a saltwater lake that you see all kinds of life in. And then after this money that was put in and the work that was done over the next, you know, 10 to 15 years, maybe still going on today, uh, we have seen, and this to me is, a, is, a, is an important success story, a return of an ecosystem that's very vibrant with life. And, and that's also part of the tragedy of what we're seeing now. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest things that underscores that is, I mean, last year we saw salmon return to the lake for the first time in, I think, decades. Um, and, and we were just starting to see those things come in, right? There had been uh, observations of seals coming in. There was a freshwater otter that came in through Lake Merritt and ended up in Lake Temescal a couple years ago. I mean, it was all of the signs that things are headed in the right direction, um, you know, that this habitat is repair getting solid and then growing and expanding in its diversity much like i mean i think one one of the kind of the cultural aspects of lake merit that's always appealed to me is that it is that same kind of abundant diversity that oakland is it's all of these individuals from all over the world as far as marine organisms have all ended up in one place and they've learned to kind of function together um and so it's kind of this kind of dual image of the city for me when i go out to lake merit now, in my introduction, I, I said it's likely that this die-off has been called by, uh, caused by an algae bloom. Uh, I, I guess we don't it hasn't been definitively proven yet, but more than likely. Uh, but however, you called it an algal bloom, and, and there's an important distinction here. So, at least I think there is. So, so tell me. No, tell, no it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably it's probably me just being sleepy this morning and, and mixing my words. But yeah, algae bloom. So we the the organism. Well, an algal bloom is is a real thing, right? It's sort of when it does turn deadly. Yeah, yeah. So it is when it kind of turns deadly. And the the species we're dealing with, this heterosigma um, species or genera, isn't known to produce toxins. There's a little bit of debate still in the literature. There's like one or two papers that say that they might think there's a toxin, but there's not a ton of evidence around it. So we really think the way that this specific algae ends up killing stuff is usually through through depletion of oxygen, which is definitely what we saw in Lake Merritt. And so we were lucky enough that that same day, Sunday, uh, there was a group kind of 
led by Katie Noonan out there doing an event to introduce people to the diversity of the lake. Um, and she happened to be doing a dissolved oxygen test. And so around noon, Katie did a dissolved oxygen test and dissolved oxygen was less than one part per million. So we're basically talking no oxygen. And that's why we were seeing the big die off. And it wasn't just fish. It was fish, crabs, the marine worms, basically anything in the water that needs oxygen was starting to suffocate. Um, and, and you could see that in the fish, say in the Western arm, they were all coming to the surface, trying to get oxygen by getting close to, you know, where the air layer is. Um, I mean, it was just, it uh, just, I, I can't even put it into words, just how disturbing and devastating that was to, to see on Sunday. Um, and then to know that it was going to continue um, because most of these anoxic events, when you have a drop in, in O2 in the water, happens usually very late at night. And that's because the algae can sometimes be producing oxygen into the water when there's sunlight around, they're doing photosynthesis. But at night, they're only doing cellular respiration and not the photosynthesis. So they're actually helping gobble up all of the oxygen in the water. And so you usually have the biggest O2 depletion right before sunrise. Um, and so that's why I returned yesterday um, because I knew that that Western arm would probably go through a, a further anoxic event. And yeah, all of the, the big fish that had gone over there on Sunday to hide out um, had, had died. They were dead um, on Monday. Yeah, because yeah, I, I, yeah. I went out there then again on Monday. And as you say, on Sunday, you're, the bat rays are really dramatic because you, know, you, you may see a bat ray, at least me personally, once a year uh, in the lake. Here, there were, and you counted 39 dead bat rays uh, in the lake, and that's just the ones that, that you could see. Um, and, it, and, and, that's, it, and that's just the western corner. And that was the western corner, which is actually a very small small part of a much larger lake. And, and, and on Sunday, the larger bat rays, I think, had all died. All the ones I saw died. But there were still smaller, I'm assuming, baby bat rays that were still swimming around. Uh, the next day they were all dead too but what i did notice on sunday is that they were swimming and i have video of it that i'll put in a video of our conversation uh video of the baby bat rays swimming on very shallow water almost on the surface which made and that's how i was able to get the video but it made me think yeah that's probably where the oxygen still was yep and that's why i saw with the bigger bat rays early sunday when i was there they were all in the shallows flapping around basically just trying to get oxygenated what causes an algae bloom? There's the difficulty is there's a multitude of factors, but it's usually, you know, these factors, um, water temperatures, because this helps different algae emerge from different life cycles. So some, some are in cyst states. So some of them need a warm temperature to emerge from their cyst. Um, but really what allows them to kind of kick off and really grow large is nutrients in the water. So we're usually talking nitrogen and phosphorus. And that can come from lots of different sources. And so when I look at what's going on right now, I'm thinking, well, what are the largest potential places that nitrogen and phosphorus can be coming from? And I feel like there's like two major ones um, that I'm really hoping get deeply investigated. And that is basically, you know, the processed sewage from the East Bay cities that goes out into, into the Bay. Um, and then also, stuff coming down from the Central Valley um, through the Delta system. So fertilizers and things like that. And so I think those are kind of the, the two biggest things I would be looking at if I'm trying to track back where do the nutrients come that allowed this bloom to get so large. Yeah. So, so the human causes and influences yeah. for algae blooms. Yep. We're starting to hear reports of other die-offs throughout the Bay. What do you know? So um, through using iNaturalist, this kind of citizen science app where people can take pictures of organisms, upload them to the global data, database where people can see them and identify them, um, we're very aware now of fish die-offs going on in Richmond. A number of sturgeon have showed up in Richmond, which is really concerning. Sturgeon are very, you know, long living fish. They tend to live kind of down at the depths. Um, some of them have federal protection. So like the green sturgeon has federal protection. There's a couple of those that have rolled up in Richmond, but then we're seeing fish also show up all the way down in Santa Clara County too. 
Um, a fellow just posted, I want to say it was over 10 sturgeon down there and probably over 10 striped bass down there. Um, and so we're really just seeing it all over. Um, and so one of the things I've been really involved with in the past day is trying to get more just community members to go out there and document what's going on the shorelines. I feel like right now we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg of what's going on with the die off related to the algal bloom. Um, and so getting more people out there to photograph them and then upload them to iNaturalist will help us all see a bigger picture of what's going on. And that may help us understand some of the causes of the al algal bloom and the ramifications of it, which hopefully can, you know, influence policy down the road. From, from Richmond to Santa Clara County, this, this is a large, large portion of the Bay. Yeah. I mean, this, this is not a really small large. area. Uh -huh. Yeah. And right now, I mean, that's just a handful of observers. I think there's 30 people that have submitted data. And I can almost guarantee you within the next three, four days, as more of these INAT users or other people just beginning to use INAT, start putting stuff up there. I think we're going to see this go around, you know, the entire bay, deep into Sassoon Bay, potentially, um, which would be interesting, right? Because if it is fertilizer coming down from the valley, one would expect a pretty massive event back in the San Pablo and, Sass and Sassoon Bays. And so I'm really hoping to see more observational data come from there um, because, you know, a lot of people want to be like, oh, it's this, it's this group that did the problem, but like, most of us that really care about this, we don't care. We just want to know what the what caused it, right? It's not about tagging this on somebody. It's just saying, okay, this is where our, our problem is. How, as a species now, do we engineer to make this better in the future and try to avoid these blooms in the future? Tell me more about INAT. So iNaturalist is a application you can download onto your phone and you just make a user account, you can take pictures of any organism, anything alive or dead in this case, upload it to a global database where folks like me are on there every night helping people identify stuff. And so it's a really great tool to just learn what's about what's around you. Um, I'm a molecular biologist by training. And so the world of big biology, things bigger than a cell, I really didn't have a lot of background in. So, I mean, I learned a lot about my local ecosystem by using iNaturalist. Um, it's a wonderful tool for people to learn, document, you know, and help out when things like this take place. Will Lake Merritt recover from this? I mean, it, it looks like not not every not all fish have died. There, there are yep. some then some swarms of, of fish. I don't I don't know the name of actually, but 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 it seems like most of them have died. Yeah. So I mean, this is it's like watching a, a forest burn, right? Forests burn down, but they do come back. And I think that's what we're going to see with Lake Merritt. You know, we had a major die off of these of these organisms and that will have a ripple effect for a short time and potentially a long time. Right. Because we lost the, we lost a big portion of the food web here. So expect to see those bird numbers go down this winter. Um, expect to see other things that depend upon that side of the food web to not be there quickly. Um, but I think. On the short term, we are seeing signs Lake Merritt is recovering, right? So yesterday when we were out signs there- Signs already, which is interesting. Yep. You can see fish going around again, which means that that anoxic event has probably peaked and passed um, because those fish weren't showing signs of struggling for air and things like that. So oxygen is back up. So fish are coming back in from the bay and kind of coming into that zone. Um, but- you know, the things that are going to be slower to get in there because they can't swim in immediately are going to be things like the marine worms, like the bivalves, like the clams, mussels and things like that, that also went through a really large die off the last two days. Well, the mussels are interesting. And that's one of the fascinating things about the lake. When you walk around it and you just look at the, the edges, you see just mounds of mussels, which is pretty fantastic. They died off, too. A good portion of them that. died off from what, I, from what I could see. So if you walk around the lake right now, you'll see a lot of them are open. Um, and that's not usually what mussels do when they're out of the water. Um, and this, I, I observed this all over kind of Alameda and Bay Farm Island, uh, on Sunday, Monday too, which is a lot of the bivalves, they are open meat still inside. So they're dying due to this anoxic event. That's heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah, it, it really is. I mean, this is, this is big. I've, I've been here for 20 years, you know, observing the lake and kind of the Bay Area, and I've never seen something of this magnitude. We had a large algal bloom in 2004, but 
nothing, nothing close to this. It, it almost reminds me, uh, environmentally probably very different, but just sort of the effect, at least that I'm feeling of when we had that oil spill back in, I think, like 2007 or, or 8 when, a, when an oil rig hit uh, the Bay Bridge. And, yep. you know, a lot of people were concerned about that. But, I mean, this this could be potentially a large die-off. We already know it's a large die-off in Lake Merritt, but potentially around the entire bay. Yeah. And it's funny you say oil slick because that's what I thought this was originally when I was leaving town on August 2nd and I saw it from the plane because it was just this deep, dark stream basically going from kind of Yerba Buena Island all the way back past Alameda Island. And it was just in the center of the bay. And I'd put it on, I think, Instagram and somebody, you know, was like, oh, are you guys having an oil slick in the bay? And I'm like, I I don't know. And then when I got back and it was the algal bloom, you know, starting to spread. I mean, it's been that that large. Um, and I mean, you see reports in San Francisco through the media and stuff like that. Like they're seeing the bloom over there as well. Like this is not just isolated to the East Bay. Yeah. Regret- regrettably, you predicted it. I remember yeah. your post several weeks ago when you told people to look out for, for something like this. And, and my immediate reaction was like, come on, Damon. Yeah, no, that's, that's, I mean, that's kind of how I felt too. And I was like, I'm just going to put it out there. It was August 10th. I think I put that up and I didn't see anything right for almost two weeks. And I was like, Oh, okay. You know, crying wolf. Great. That's fine. And then, and then Sunday happened. And I mean, I, my heart just dropped. Damon Ty, thank you for taking this time to talk to us about this today. Yep. Thank you for having me. Damon Ty has been our guest. Again, he works in biotech and in his spare time, he is a naturalist with a 20-year history observing observing organisms of Lake Merritt. He has joined us to talk about the die-off that is happening in Oakland's Lake Merritt and now seems to be happening in other places around the San Francisco Bay region.